Institute at the University of Missouri. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. New Zealand mountaineer Sir Edmund Hillary and Nepalese Sherpa Tenzing Norgay were the first to climb Mount Everest in 1953. Since then, Nepal's Sherpa people have been helping an ever-growing number of foreigners climb Everest. Climbing the peak has become a $300 million a year industry, with mountaineering companies offering climbers ever more comfortable camp accommodations on the mountain. But some things haven't changed. Climbing Everest is still incredibly dangerous. And just as Hillary got much more fame than Norgay for their trip to the summit, Sherpas have gotten just a fraction of the money generated by Everest treks. In recent years, that's led to growing tension between Sherpas, Nepal's government, and foreign mountaineering companies. That tension is incredibly well detailed in a new documentary called Sherpa Trouble on Everest, written and directed by Jennifer Piedem. It's currently on the International Film Festival circuit and recently played the True False Film Festival in Missouri. Joining us today to talk about conflict on Mount Everest is Jennifer Piedem. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's well, great to be here. Jennifer, I was really interested. How did you decide to shoot a movie on this topic to begin with? Um, on and off over a decade, I'd worked as a camera operator and high altitude director on Everest expeditions and, and was endlessly surprised to the extent to which the Sherpas ended up on the cutting room floor of these films and and weren't highlighted. So it was always an idea in the back of my mind that somebody should tell the Sherpas' point of view. Um, and so that's what I decided to do. And one of the interesting aspects of telling the story of these expeditions from the Sherpa's point of view is how differently Sherpas view mountain climbing even from Westerners. And we have a clip we're going to play just now that, that illustrates that. We Sherpa people have a great respect for that mountain. She's the mother god of the earth. Over here we climb mountains, but it's a holy place. Western people approach it as a physical challenge how close you can get to death. Talk to us just a little bit about the interaction of foreigners and, and Sherpas on, on Everest. Well, I guess most people who go to climb Everest do it once or attempt it once, and um, so they're going for a very short period. They don't have time, I guess, to, to get to know the Sherpa people very deeply, um, and they, they go with a mission, and that is to climb the highest mountain in the world, and, and it requires a lot of effort to do that. And... Um, on the other hand, the Sherpas, this is their livelihood. Um, I mean, they're an ethnic group of people that just happen to be genetically blessed to work well at altitude and they live around the foothills of Everest. And, and so for them, it's a job and it's an opportunity um, to earn a lot more money than they would in other, in other jobs and other professions. And so inherently, there's a conflict there um, because what's um, good for them spiritually um, is often at conflict with, you know, what they have to observe going on on the mountain um, because the Western climbers don't generally view the mountain with the same level of respect and certainly spiritual reverence that, that the Sherpas do. And tell us just a little bit about the economics of the mountaineering industry in Everest. Hundreds and hundreds of people climb Everest uh, in most years now. How much money does that generate for the local people? How much are people paying to go up the mountain? Um, I think the issue is, is it doesn't generate nearly enough for the local community. So the government takes um, a massive fee per person um, every year. Um, I think they, they have a permit fee of $10,000. It generates millions and millions of dollars every year for the Nepalese government. And I think what the Sherpas are angry about is that not enough is being put back into the Sherpa community when a, when a, a high altitude worker is killed on Mount Everest. This last, in 2014, when the avalanche happened, they were offered $400 compensation. Um, most foreign climbers will spend over $75,000 US to, to be on this trip. Um, if a Sherpa makes it all the way to the summit with all their bonuses and things like that, they may earn up, up to $5,000. Um, so there's a fair discrepancy between those two numbers. Um, so their payment for the entire season, including going to the top of Mount Everest, is $5,000 then? And that would be, that'd be a maximum. There'd be a lot that, that would earn less than that. Uh, well, that's, that's an incredibly small amount of money, given the risks involved. And you detail those risks uh, very explicitly in this film, because I understand that there are some things that have changed about climbing Mount Everest over the last 60 years, but there's this still one particularly dangerous part of climbing Everest that hasn't changed. Can you tell us just a bit about that? Yes, over the years, um, particularly since 1996 and that disaster that was detailed in the, in the recent um, feature film Everest, 
a lot of things have changed, the fixed ropes, the oxygen, um, Sherpa support training and things like that. Certain things have become safer, but the Kumbu Icefall, which is where everybody has to climb through in order to get um, onto the mountain proper if they're going to climb from the Nepalese side, is this incredibly dangerous jumble of ice that is moving all of the time and you have big blocks of ice that are bigger than apartment buildings that can fall at any moment and the Sherpas have to make up to 30 trips a season through this icefall in comparison to most of the climbers who only do two or three trips through it per season. So for the Sherpas, every time they go through that icefall, it's it's like playing Russian roulette. And why is it... Why is it they're going through this ice fall 30 times a season then? Because they're carrying supplies for foreign climbers. So they're carrying tents and they're carrying oxygen and they're carrying gas to heat the tents up at Camp 2. Um, they're carrying food, tables, chairs, toilet tents, all sorts of things, even carpets um, to be in those the advanced base camp, which is Camp 2 on Everest. And how come this all this equipment, how come it's not flown in? It can't be flown in because the Nepalese government doesn't allow helicopters to fly um, um, above base camp that is um, and that that's a controversial decision a lot of the operators are pushing for that to happen to reduce the risk for Sherpas um, I think the issues are that it's I mean it is extremely dangerous to fly helicopters at that altitude that's the first reason um, and then it's also very fragile the the environment is very fragile and and I think it's a largely environmental concerns and then the third reason is that people think well where do you stop there? When, why, why won't you just fly people to the summit, you know, and, and it's a slippery slope. So there's a lot of reasons not to do it. For me personally, anything that makes the job safer for the Sherpas, if Everest is going to continue to be this popular and, and hundreds of people to go every year, you know, I personally would be in favour of anything that, that made things safer for the Sherpas. And when they're going through this ice field, they, correct me if I'm wrong, they actually have to go through it at night uh, because the sun hitting the ice can cause it to shift and people can be buried or fall into these huge crevasses or crushed by huge blocks of ice. Is that correct? Look, it's dangerous at any time that you go through it, but it's in the dead of night. It's a lot colder. Um, it's very, very cold up there, and so it's a lot more stable. Once the sun hits, it becomes increasingly unstable. And and as you saw in the film in, um, in April 2014, a massive block of ice broke off from above the climbing route and, and, and I think it was 14,000 tonnes of ice fell onto the climbing route while the Sherpas were carrying supplies. And it ultimately killed 16 people. And that, I think, raises some of the moral issues about this industry, if you will. And we have a clip that we're going to play that speaks just a little bit to some of the risks faced by Sherpas. We have about 120 Sherpas or so that have died so far. The risks that people were making the Sherpas take. What is the moral justification for that? We listened to that clip here, and we were just hearing a mountaineering writer talking about the risks that the Sherpas are made to take. But of course, the Sherpas aren't forced into this line of work, but it is incredibly dangerous. Why are so many of them doing this if it is so risky? Because of lack of alternatives, basically. Um, so there's not, um, to live in the Everest region, um, really the only industry is, is growing potatoes, um, herding yaks and, um, and working on Everest um, or other mountaineering expeditions. So, you know, th they may be lucky enough just to be able to work on treks, but the big money is working on Everest. I mean, $5,000 is, is 10 times the average national income in Nepal. So they stand to earn a lot more money a lot quicker if they, if they work on these expeditions. And so I think Anyone can understand that if you had that opportunity, you know, you might go for it. You might, particularly if you're young and you don't have a family. Um, but I think, you know, just like us, everyone wants to educate their kids and, and look after their future. And, and so that's the temptation. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Today we're talking about efforts by Sherpa people in Nepal to get better wages and benefits for doing incredibly dangerous work helping hikers up Mount Everest. We're joined by Jennifer Peedham, director of the film Sherpa, Trouble on Everest, which covers the lives of Sherpas on the mountains and tensions with the Nepalese government and foreign mountaineering companies. Jennifer Peedham, 
Tell us, uh, if you would, just a little bit about one of the main characters in your film. I believe he's called Purba Teshi. Uh, and you're shooting this film in 2014, and he is either, is what, he's one short of the record number of climbs to the top of Mount Everest, and he's sort of facing a decision about whether or not to go to the top and become the world record holder for a sense of the world's highest mountain. Yeah, that's right. So Purba Teshi is, I've known for 10 years, um, He's an incredible man. He's incredibly softly spoken and and is not arrogant in the least. Um, yet he yeah he's faced with this dilemma um, to become the world record holder for the most number of ascents, which is in a sense a very Western kind of pursuit. Um, but that may bring more fame and therefore more income for his family, which is probably something he's interested in. Um, but I think when the avalanche happened, that idea was really. Um, it caused him a massive dilemma because his family were absolutely devastated by what had happened and terrified that, um, you know, that he may be killed and were very, very against him climbing. So it was a, a really difficult decision for him to decide what to do. And a good part of your film, we should say, is following Probateshi and uh, the mountaineering leader Russell Bryce and a group of tourists who are planning to go up Mount Everest in 2014. And this comes just after a year after there was like this really well-publicized fight on Mount Everest between Sherpas and climbers. Talk to us about that. Yes, yeah, so in 2013, um, there was this, it really became an international incident. There was this fight that broke out between some professional climbers um, who were attempting a new route on Everest, um, but they were using this common route. And when they were climbing on the mountain, um, it was at the same time that the Sherpas were fixing ropes and um, an incident broke out, some, some bad words were spoken and the Sherpas are incredibly offended. And, and it, for me, it was an indication that this was a tipping point. You know, it was a straw that broke the camel's back. Um, the Sherpas do suffer a lot of disrespect from foreign climbers and this was too much um, and this fight broke out. And what do you mean by disrespect? Like, how do you, how do you see that? Uh, I don't know if I can use the words on your show, but it was very insulting. Um, they used words that insulted, if you think about Everest, to them as Chomolonga, which means mother goddess of the earth. And they used the words that directly insulted the mother, um, if you can imagine. So it was it was very upsetting to them. I think it was probably just a testosterone fuel incident, but it became something much bigger. Um, and and it, that fight really... Um, set a tone for the following year's expeditions such that when the avalanche happened suddenly everyone was uh, this heightened awareness that Sherpas do get angry and they will um, be violent if necessary and so it was this undertone of violence that kind of um, underscored the whole um, aftermath of the avalanche in 2014. So there's already this context of tension then between the foreign mountaineers and the Sherpas from 2013. The next season in 2014 uh, here we're following Perbateshi and Russell Bryce's group as they are beginning to uh, prepare to go up Mount Everest. And then there is this avalanche in which 16 people die. All of them, we should say, were Sherpas who died, right? And then how does the Sherpa community on Everest react at following that avalanche? Their initial reaction was grief, um, and that grief very quickly turned to anger. Um, but I really must say that it was never directed towards, certainly not to me, I felt in no danger at any point. Um, there was a lot of threats of violence. They all turned out just to be rumours, I have to say. Um, but I'm not sure whether the expedition leaders helped perpetuate those rumours to help give them a better reason for cancelling or quite why there were these vicious rumours flying around base camp. But I never saw any evidence of that. The Sherpas were very angry at the government for the poultry amount of compensation that was offered to so the victims' So when you're talking families. about these rumours, there are actually rumours that there, there, was, well, there was a group of Sherpas who said nobody should climb the mountain this year, we need to grieve and recover from this accident. In essence, in any Sherpa that goes up the mountain with a group will be have their legs broken or face violence or be beaten up potentially. That was, that that was, was the rumour that was being... That was rumour. That was absolutely rumour and, and it was never verified. And, and I think it was perpetuated it by, by the expedition leaders. I don't think that that was what was really going on. From what I could see, none of the Sherpas wanted to climb. It wasn't a group of three or four that were perpetuating this violent reaction, that they were 
devastated by what had happened and it's very important to understand that they believed that the mountain was angry but spiritually three of their um, Sherpa colleagues were still trapped in the ice and their bodies were unable to be recovered and still haven't been recovered and that has real spiritual significance for the Sherpa people and to walk over that place um, has very negative consequences for them spiritually and, and, and I've had conversations with the expedition leaders since then that where they, they keep you know, they keep going with this idea that it was just three or four or four or five Sherpas that were agitating. I don't think that was true. I don't think any of the Sherpas wanted to climb. And I spoke, there was not a single Sherpa that I spoke to that said that they wanted to climb. Well, let's just set the scene then for our listeners, because here we do have this avalanche where 16 people have just died. Uh, and the Sherpas basically have gathered and are saying, we don't want to climb. We want to cancel the season. Now you also have uh, these international or foreign mountaineering companies who have brought uh, dozens, even hundreds of people to the mountain, uh, paying up to $75,000 a piece to climb the mountain. They have to go to them now and say, sorry, you can't, you can't go up the mountain. How, 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 how is that handled, uh, particularly given that the mountaineering leader that you follow, Russell Bryce, had been forced to cancel his expedition two years earlier? Look, I think Russell Bryce was in a really difficult situation and, um, you know, he, I guess he was between a rock and a hard place, you know, he, he was under tremendous pressure to continue the expedition, yet he does look after his Sherpas very well. I think he knew in his heart what his Sherpas wanted, um, but it was very difficult to tell that to the clients. You know, I, can, I can't speak for him. I don't know whether he believed the threats of violence or not. That was the reason he gave for cancelling. Um, he did say to the clients that his Sherpas wanted to climb, but they didn't want to climb because they were scared of these other people. I don't believe that to be the case, and I had many Sherpas on camera saying that they didn't want to climb. Um, they all felt that it was the best thing to respect the fallen colleagues by, by, by leaving, but also to respect the mountain and give the mountain a rest. Um, and it's just a, it's a very, they're two very different perspectives. and. In those situations, it was really clear to me that the two sides are having real trouble understanding each other's points of view. And ultimately, this puts Prabhateshi, the lead Sherpa, in a bind in the film because he has worked with the mountaineering leader, Russell Bryce, for uh, 15, 16 years at this point. They have a long-established partnership. Prabhateshi himself, as we mentioned earlier, is about to potentially set the record for number of ascents up uh, Mount Everest. So talk to us about his, his dilemma. Well, his family, as you saw in the film, his wife, his mother, uh, you know, they were they really against him climbing. They felt to go to the mountain so many times was disrespectful. His mother says in the film, it's it, God will get angry if you do this too many times. It's disrespectful to God. So he had a lot of pressure from his family not to go. You can see in their eyes when he leaves, you know, his children are fighting back tears. Um, it's it's a really it's a really conflicted situation for him, yet he wants to um, support his family and, and provide them with a future and be able to educate his children. And so it's a real dilemma for him. And so he's a microcosm, if you like, of, of the broader situation, that these Sherpa families, they need the money. They want to educate their kids just like the rest of us. And here is a great opportunity to do that and do it very well. Um, yet their lives are at risk every time. And, and the compensation is so bad when somebody loses their life that the families will probably be destitute if they lose their husband and their main breadwinner. So it's a, it's a really awful dilemma. You're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Today we're talking about efforts by Sherpa people in Nepal to get better wages and benefits for doing incredibly dangerous work helping hikers up Mount Everest. We're joined by Jennifer Peedham, director of the film Sherpa, Trouble on Everest, which covers the lives of Sherpas on the mountains and tensions with the Nepalese government and foreign mountaineering companies. A reminder that if you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read our ongoing series of interviews with journalists in exile around the world and coverage of foreign affairs and press freedom issues. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Germ. And Jennifer Peedham, one thing I wanted to ask you about that I thought your film did a nice job of bringing out was relating this to how Tenzing Norgay was treated. Uh, obviously, he was either the first or the second person up Mount Everest. Uh, but uh, obviously, Sir Edmund Hillary is the one uh, who has gotten a lot of the attention, uh, at least in the West, for that achievement. Talk to us just a little bit about some parallels between what happened 60 years ago and what you saw happening uh, in 2014. 
There's a great line in the film where Tenzing Norgay's son says, in 1953, two men climbed Everest. Um, uh, two men were knighted, the other man was my father. So the expedition leader and Edmund Hillary were knighted, Tenzing Norgay was not. And I think the reason that we included that story in the film is that he is the guy that made Sherpa so famous, um, the name Sherpa. He, he almost created the brand Sherpa of that smiling, friendly person in the background, always willing to help. Yet by the footage that we use, you, you show, and, and speaking to his family, um, I think it shows that the seeds of discontent about this unequal treatment was sown way back then in 1953 when Tenzing Norgay wasn't given the respect that he deserved for, for what he had achieved. And you talk about how the Sherpas themselves, how their communities have changed some over the last 60 years since then, how uh, as the communities have uh, gotten wealthier and had more education, their views of their interactions with foreigners have changed. Talk to us about that. That's right. I mean, 20 years ago, most Sherpas wouldn't have finished, been to high school now, most of them finish high school and go on to have a higher education. You have many Sherpas traveling overseas to get university educations or, or, or being trained um, as high altitude guides alongside international guides um, at the very top levels in the world. And so they see the way that things should be and and they've started to feel that they deserve more respect. I think that's why there was a willingness to cooperate with us in making this film. Um, education changes everything and in my view what you have here is a people working towards self-determination and they, they simply believe that they deserve more respect. Now in this film after the avalanche that takes place in which 16 people were killed, you mentioned that a lot of the anger by the Sherpa community is directed towards the Nepalese government. Talk to us just a little bit about the relations between Nepal's government and, and the Sherpas. Well, Sherpa are, are an ethnic minority and, and traditionally, you know, they were, 60 years ago, they were kind of the lowest caste in Nepalese society, but very quickly they've become one of the wealthiest, um, if not the wealthiest, because of Everest mountaineering. Yet the government um, gives nothing back for the massive contribution. I mean, the Everest industry and the trekking industry is probably the largest industry other than exporting foreign workers in Nepal. And they are the cornerstone of that, yet they receive nothing from the government. There's no royalties put back into their communities for health care, to educate their children, that kind of thing. And so there's a lot of frustration on behalf of those workers that they feel like they're not getting anything back for the risks that they take. And uh, at the close of the film, the Sherpas have succeeded in closing down the Everest season in 2014. Correct me if I'm wrong, no expeditions went to the top of Mount Everest as a result of this accident. And Perbateshi, the lead Sherpa that, uh, you had, uh, that we talked about earlier in the film, decides to retire and not climb Everest again. Tell us, tell us just a little bit about what's happened to him and to the mountaineering guide Russell Bryce since this tragedy. Well, in 2015, um, everything went ahead as normal. Perbatashi wasn't going to climb and he, he was going to work for Russell at base camp. Um, as you probably know from, from the news, that in 2015 there was a massive earthquake which triggered another avalanche at, at base camp this time, killed 20 people, I think 10 Sherpas. Um, so the expedition was can cancelled again. Um, so everything that, that you saw happening in 2014, all of that debate and anger and frustration happened all over again. Although I think probably this time the decision was a little easier and they also closed climbing on the Tibet side of the mountain out of respect for the Sherpas. Um, what that meant though for many of the Sherpas is that at home their houses had collapsed and their lodges that they'd spent all of their incomes on building to provide a future income had also collapsed. So Perbatashi, for example, has has had massive damage to his house, his lodge, um, and therefore his ability to earn any income. So there was no income for the Sherpas for two years in a row. Um, plus they had all these massive expenses in rebuilding. So it's it's been a really diff difficult two years for the Sherpas. Um, and many of them are starting to rebuild. Lots of people have tried to raise money. We've raised helped raise money for Perbatashi to help get him out of debt, but it's a crazy state of affairs that the the most um, experienced high altitude climber in the world is in debt um, and is you know is struggling to to rebuild his life. And talk to us just a little bit about what the future of climbing on Everest looks like. How how do you see it changing over the next few years, given how popular it has become? 
I think what I'll say to that is that what 2014 proved by the Sherpas sort of uniting in their grief and anger to cancel the season proved that Everest can't be climbed without the Sherpas. And I think as difficult as that was for them, and a lot of them lost a lot of income, it meant that for the future, no one's going to take them for granted. And I think they have improved things for the future. Um, this year, 2016, um, the season starts very soon. It starts in 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 March, April, and you know, let's hope everything goes well this season. And the season. season is just two months long, is that That's correct? That's right. The season lasts for eight weeks. And what was, for you, what was the most difficult part of shooting this film? Obviously, there's a lot of physical difficulty involved in being at high altitude. Um, I think, you know, making a film like this, when you suddenly find yourself in a situation like this, you know, you are consumed by the ethics of what you're doing and whether or not it's right to continue um, and and what not to film and what to film and whether or not it's right to continue. And ultimately the reason that we decided to continue was that the Sherpa community wanted us to. I think they wanted this film to be made and they're very proud of it. And we do have just one more clip to play that I think speaks to some of these ethical issues that you talk about. They're angry, yes, they are, for lack of respect. Every time I send the Sherpas up in the mountain, it's like sending them off to war. I don't know who's going to come home. That last clip, we should say, comes from the mountaineering uh, expedition leader, Russell Bryce. And then there's sound of that uh, actual avalanche from 2014 that ends there. Tell us just a little bit about the ethics involved in being a mountaineering expedition leader, where you do have sort of big dollars and big risk. Well, I guess he's balancing the need of, of, of his clients and his Sherpas. I mean, Russell Bryce is very concerned about the safety of his Sherpas. That's why he cancelled his expedition in 2012 for the, exactly that reason. And and it turned out, he, he almost predicted what happened in 2014. And what happened in 2014 was exactly what he predicted in 2012. So it's almost like he, he could see this thing happening. And I know that it causes him to stay awake at night. I mean, it would be a tremendous responsibility, all of those lives. But he's very good at what he does. Um, it was a very difficult expedition. Um, you know, he's seen the film. He thinks it's tough but fair. Um, you know, he comes across, um, you know, tried at times. It, it, it's a difficult film for him. Um, and he was in a real dilemma. And so um, I think it would be a pretty tough job to have. It would be one of the toughest jobs in the world to run Everest expeditions. And with just about 30 seconds left, do you see, you do focus on some of the children of the Sherpas in the film and talk about sort of the difficulties of them watching their fathers go off to do this incredibly dangerous task. Do you see them continuing this tradition 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or is this something that we're gonna look back on and say this was, this was a crazy practice? Look, I don't know. I know that Pervatashi's wife is absolutely dreading the day that her boys go off to climb the mountain. I think Pervatashi is climbing so that they don't have to, um, just like Tenzing Norgay climbed so his sons didn't have to. Um, they know how dangerous it is and they're trying to prevent their own children having to do this, but, but so it continues regardless. That's going to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Many thanks to Jennifer Peetum for joining us. Global Journalist executive producer is Joshua Kransberg. Our lead producer this week is Ayulia Alieva. Our studio director is Travis McMillan of RJI. Pat Akers of KBI is our audio engineer. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for joining us.